my friends, we are gonna go deep, deep, deep into an old lady's lore hole. Greetings, owners of fine luxury cardboard rectangles. We are here today to discuss a little known character in the great multiverse of Magic the Gathering. What happened was I was settling in to get my Urza lore ready, specifically talking about Urza Master Artificer, the new card from Modern Horizons, where we see Urza at the height of his earthly power before he has become a planeswalker. Now Urza lived for like four or 5,000 years. We're gonna talk about a brief window of time at the very, very beginning with the character who really essentially, in my opinion at least, is like Urza and Mishra's mother. And again, this is someone who's not talked about a lot. We're dealing with Tukasia. On this occasion, we're gonna talk Tukasia, all right? So, basically how it went, just so you guys know in case you didn't, Urza's birth was so important that essentially there is an entire calendar system built around his birth. So year zero, is the year that Urza was born in. Interestingly enough, Urza was born on the first day of this year and Mishra was born on the last day of the year. So Urza's almost one full year older than his brother. And Tukasia will feature in the struggle between the two brothers for power and dominance. It is a tragic but very interesting tale. So how, how did this all happen? Well, originally, obviously, Urza and Mishra were born. Now their mother only lasted for a few years and honestly in terms of magic lore there's no real discussion whatsoever of what their parents, especially their mother, was like. The father, they, they, were, they were nobility. The father went ahead and remarried. Now the new stepmother of Urza and Mishra honestly didn't really care for them that much. At best they could hope from her was indifference. At worst they would get uh, derision. Basically, the mother wanted nothing to do with them. She just wanted to live her life with her new husband and saw the children as baggage. So when Urza and Mishra were roughly about 10 years old, in 10 AR, AR is Argivian Reckoning, and that is the dating system that's based on Urza's birth. So 10 years into it, when Urza would have been 10 and Mishra could have either been nine or 10, that's when Tukasia enters the story. She is an ancient Argivian archaeologist and the boys were sent to study with her. Now Argive, in case you didn't know, was one of the um, was the most northern northernly of the three coastal kingdoms on Dominaria, specifically in the Teriasair area. Now there are a few cards that actually reference this old time in Magic the Gathering. They're from antiquities. We're not going to go over all of them. The most interesting ones are the Argivian Archaeologist where basically when I look at Argivian Archaeologist, if you look at the artwork, it's literally just an archaeologist. It feels like a real world archaeologist. There's not really anything there to make it feel magical unless you kind of look at the scratchings on the rock in the back and go, okay, you know what, like, hey, it, it looks like prim primitive, primitive cave scratchings. But either way, this is a standard, standard issue, Argivian archaeologists. So what do they do? Well, they're three mana for a 1-1. One, one. You pay two white and tap it to return an artifact card from a graveyard to your hand. And that will feature very prominently in the concept of Tekasia. Tekasia was one of these Argivian archaeologist. She, in fact, was a senior Argivian archaeologist. And the Argivian archaeologists combined with Argivian blacksmiths were very, very adept in reconstructing old artifacts. Now, Tekasia was involved in digging up old Thran artifacts. And the Thran artifacts all come in from the time of Yogmoth. Now, Yogmoth's existence, his original existence when he was a human, was 5,000 years before, roughly. 5,000 years before Urza and Mishra even existed. And interestingly enough, the Argivian blacksmith artwork is pretty normal looking, but the flavor text says, through years of study and training, the blacksmiths of Argive became adept at reassembling the mangled remains of the strange mechanical creatures 
abounding in their native land. Imagine that. Imagine becoming a blacksmith that is adept in actually reconstructing these magical constructs that have been found by these Argivian archaeologists. So Tacasia, Tacasia was one of these Argivian archaeologists. She taught Mishra and Urza the basics of artifice and helped them learn of the Thran Empire. Now, obviously, in the this is this is long before Urza knows about Yagmoth, and even it it actually takes a fair bit of time in Urza's storyline for him to learn that Phyrexians and all of that are actually spawned from the Thran. So for a long time, Urza drew on the lessons from the Thran, tried to emulate the Thran, and end up like using that knowledge in his battle against Phyrexia. But this is where it all comes together, right? She's the one who's responsible. Essentially, for 10 years, these two lived under the guidance of Dacasia. From AR-10 to AR-20, a span of 10 years, these two children were raised by her. She was the one who took them um, to Koilos, and we'll, we'll get into that. We'll take a look at a couple of the cards that specifically reference Dacasia, because she actually shows up in the flavor text of some ancient magic artifacts. So there are, in fact, there are things that originally, there are artifacts that were originally attributed to being invented by Urza or Mitra, but it actually turned out to be invented by Tecasia. One of them is the Grape Shot Catapult. Four casting cost artifact, it's an artifact creature. Two, three, this has been updated to be considered a construct. Obviously it wasn't at the time because artifacts, when they were originally made back in the day, artifact creatures didn't have creature types, but now it's been errated to be considered a construct, which makes sense, because it is a construct. And the flavor text says, For years, scholars debated whether these were Urza's or Mishra's creations. Recent research suggests they were invented by the brother's original master, Tecasia, and that uh, both used these devices. So originally, archaeologists looking back at this time frame in the future thought that these things were originally invented by either Urza or Mishra in their war against each other, but it was actually their master, Dekeju, who came up with it. If you look in the artwork, you can see what looks like a goblin kind of holding up a bat that he shot, like, look, I did it, Ma, with the catapult in the background. So it's interesting to note, there's actually a number, a number of artifacts that reference her. The Onulet is another one. So Onulet is a three casting cost, two, two artifact creature. Again, has been updated to be a construct. When Onulet's put into a graveyard from the battlefield, you gain two life. And the flavor text says, an early inspiration for Urza, Tecasia's onulets contained magical essences that could be cannibalized after they stopped functioning. How interesting is that as a concept? This is where Urza learned the concept of making artifact creatures that can serve you, but afterwards having a magical reserve that you could draw on. And there's actually other cards that reference this kind of concept as well, that when the construct is no longer functioning, you gain the advantage in another way. So the flavor text I always thought was very, very weird. It looks almost like a wandering table with weird, like, weird, almost like, if you've watched Aquaman recently, it's almost like Aquaman style long, I wanna rock hair. And it looks like the onulet is just kind of like drinking out of a bowl of water, but it's got a weird split down its face. The art for onulet always messed with me. I never really noticed all the lights and buildings in the back of the desert here. And that's where all this went down, actually. It went down, the, all of the um, the learning that the brothers did, it all went down in this vast desert, which is actually where an ancient Thran city used to be. This huge, massive desert used to be an um, like a glorious Thran city, the most powerful of the Thran cities that actually got laid to waste because of Yagmoth's machinations. Not intentionally. Yagmoth didn't want the city to be laid to waste. It just happened because he was betrayed. So Onulet is another one of these artifacts that's attributed to Tecasia. Now, there's another one called the Su Chi. Now, the Su Chi specifically is actually, um, it's like a, it's an inspired by what she found from the Thran. So the flavor text says, flawed copies of relics from the Thran Empire. The Su Chi were inherently unstable, but provided useful knowledge for Tecasia students. And this is a four casting cost four for artifact, for artifact creature. Now when it dies, you add four mana to your mana pool. Now what you have to understand is back in the day when this came out originally, this weird insectile looking creature, when he came out, mana burn was a thing. 
And most of the time, creatures would get destroyed on your opponent's turn. So usually, under the old way of playing Magic, this would this artifact creature would get smashed, and you would have four mana dumped into your mana pool right away that if you couldn't use it, ended up doing damage to you because mana burn would go, ah! like the mana's coursing through your body, setting your veins on fire and making you full of pain. So in this situation, the Suchi really did feel like an unstable, imperfect creation where you're like, okay, you managed to harness magic, but unlike the Onulet, where when it gets destroyed, you gain life and it's advantageous for you, this this flawed Thran technology could sometimes actually injure you. So you had this scenario where it felt, it felt somewhat diabolical. I genuinely enjoyed the flavor behind it. There's a lot of cool flavor in these old artifacts. If you take a look at the Ornithopter, we have another another situation where these brothers, and I mean it makes sense, if you look at the grand scale of thing, Tukasia was an old woman at the time that these brothers were brought into her care and she became their master, and she didn't have as big an impact on history as, I mean look, obviously Urza had a massive impact on the history of the world that he's from, right? He had a huge impact on Dom Dominaria to the point where Argivian Reckoning, it's time based on him. So it, it makes sense that scholars would look back and think, okay, this was made by Urza, this was made by Urza, and it's shown again in the Ornithopter. Zero casting gods, zero two flyer. Flavor text says, many scholars believe these creatures were the result of Urza's first attempt at mechanical life, perhaps created in his early days as an apprentice to Tukasia. So this is another one where it's like, okay, was this created by Tukasia? Was this created by Urza? There's theories. It's honestly got a very like Michelangelo feel to it. I don't know if you've seen like the old the old manuscripts from uh, from Michelangelo back in the day with all the drawings of flying machines and things, but it gives that kind of a vibe. And there's no actually knowing for sure whether or not this is actually attributed to him or whether it's Tukasia. This is actually the device they used to fly over to, to where they were going when they were going to the caves of Koilos. And for anybody who's interested, Koilos actually means secret in, uh, in High Argivian. And the entire area that they were in wasn't called Koilos at first. It was really just the caves of Koilos that was named by Urza for secrecy. I like that concept. It's pretty cool overall. Now, there are other cards that mention, um, that mention Tekasia as well. The um, Mishra's Workshop, you have the flavor text that says, though he eventually came to despise Tekasia, Mishra, lis Mishra listened well to her lessons on clarity of purpose. Unlike his brother, he focused his mind on a single goal. So we learned through this that Urza was more of a dilettante trying a bunch of different things, and Mishra had a really, like, really narrowed in focus specifically with what he wanted to create. That's why you'd find Mishra's workshop, Mishra's factory. He had very specific goals in creating, like, assembly worker automatons. And I like that this is all illustrated through old school flavor text, right? You can see it, uh, you can see it in cards as well like Urza's Tower. Like, you see Mishra's, Mishra's workshop tells you that Mishra learned about clarity of focus from Takasia, where if you take a look at the autumn printing of Urza's Tower, you can see in that flavor text that it's saying Urza always put Takasia's lessons on resource gathering to effective use. So you can see that in the Onulet, you can see that in the Urza's Tower, that uh, Urza learned more about gathering resources and resource management from Takasia and Mishra learned clarity of focus and narrowing in. So I, I enjoy the way that they illustrate this very much. There's a number of different cards. In fact, you can actually see some more future nods to this. When you look at Urza's factory from uh, Time Spiral, you see the flavor text saying, this is actually a quote from Takasia. Though their ideals are league apart, leagues apart, Urza's and Mishra's creations have a surprising harmony with one, on the, one another. And this is a journal entry from Takasia. And you can see, Back in the day, we had Mishra's factory. Well, this is Urza's factory, and for seven mana, it creates an assembly worker. Whereas Mishra's lands turn into 2-2 two -two assembly worker creatures, Urza's factory creates these assembly workers. And you'll see that actually Mishra's factory would be able to tap to give Urza's factory tokens a bonus. So there is an interconnectedness, and this is shown, like this is a good way of showing that Takasia had and influence in different ways and similar ways on the brothers. Now, this whole story for Takasia, unfortunately, has a tragic end. 
what happened was she accompanied the brother, the brothers, I should say, to the caves of Koilos. Now, the caves of Koilos is where two incredibly, incredibly powerful and important magical artifacts were discovered. The Might Stone and the Weak Stone. So let's take a look at these two cards. They have um, interesting flavor, but are far more important to the storyline than just the flavor of the card. So we're gonna look at the Might Stone first. This is a four casting cost artifact. Attacking creatures get plus one, plus zero. And the flavor text says, while exploring the sacred cave of Koilos with his brother, Mishra and their master Takasia, Urza fell behind in the Hall of Tagsin, where he discovered the remarkable Might Stone. And the artifact artwork is very, very, very simple. It just shows a clenched fist with energy radiating out of it. Now the Might Stone has a yin and yang relationship with the Weak Stone. So if you notice the Weak Stone, it's also a four casting cost artifact. This one gives attacking creatures minus one, minus zero. And the flavor text says, during the brother's childhood, Takasia took them to explore the sacred cave of Koilos. There in the Hall of Tags, and Mishra discovered the mysterious weak stone. So one of the brothers, Urza, found the might stone, and the other brother found the weak stone, and that ended up in Mishra's hand. Now, they, these artifacts are purported to have had other effects on them. In fact, the weak stone was supposedly what weakened Mishra's will and allowed Phyrexia to draw them to his side. Now, obviously, we'll give Mishra his own video and go more in depth with that. But understand that the Mike Stone, the Mike Stone, the Mike Stone and the Weak Stone had an actual genuine effect on both of the brothers and could be used to actually control other artifacts. They could exert control over other artifacts, and that's because they were actually power stones. It's funky to see that one was carved into the shape of a fist and the other is shaped into a weird but vicious looking dog that actually looks like it's shaking out of fright. The shape of these stones is very interesting. They were actually originally used, both of these stones were actually used as part of a keystone for a Phyrexian portal that linked Dominaria to Phyrexia. That's, that's originally what their purpose was. And while the gemstones were there, the power stones, I should say, were there, they kept the portal to Phyrexia sealed shut. But what happened is when they took these stones with them, they opened up the portal to Phyrexia. That's how Gix was able to slide on through and start to corrupt Mishra. And that led to a major war between Mishra and Urza. They, uh, they would fight over these stones. Each of them had the stones. They, were, they had a real sibling rivalry going on that was... Um, that was basically made into explosive level nonsense by the addition of these stones. These stones influenced the two brothers so that their distrust and anger with each other basically ended up with uh, them, them kind of like, they disagreed more and more with each other until Mishra actually went ahead and attacked Urza in an attempt to get the Might Stone. And this is most likely after a, an, an amount of Phyrexian influence had been felt over him. So Mishra actually tried to uh, to fight Mich uh, Urza for the stones. Now, Takasia had come in before and tried to be like, look, you guys, you need to hand these stones over to me for study. But neither of the boys would hand the stones over. They were incredibly possessive. So when Mishra went and attacked Urza, Takasia actually, as their mother figure, tried to intercede and get in between them. And there was a resultant explosion that actually ended Takasia's life. And as a result, Mishra, riddled with guilt that would later just turn to bitter hatred of Takasia, he fled off into the desert. So the way that he dealt with the grief over Takasia's death was to basically start to hate and blame her. That was the only way that he could come to terms with his responsibility for the death of Takasia. Because this, this caused the entire camp to fall apart. This Takasia used to lead over, well not until she was destroyed, she like she was in charge of a camp where nobles would send their children out to learn for a summer. They would be like, okay, we're gonna send you out for a summer. She basically, she, run a su she ran a summer camp for spoiled Argivian noble children. And as a result, a lot of them just ended up coming for a summer and going. But Urza and Mishra stayed with her for 10 years, and she had more influence over their life than, any, than anyone else, essentially, at least in their, in their living life. 
So like before, uh, you know, before Misher was dead and Urza became a planeswalker, she was she was responsible for their formative years. And Mishra, unfortunately, was the reason that she got destroyed. As a side note, it's cool to note these two stones, the Might Stone and the Weak Stone, actually contain the essence of a planeswalker whose spark never ignited. And when Urza went crazy later on, well, I mean, he wasn't really crazy at this point. It was close. Like, he was he was grief-stricken. When he was grief-stricken, he actually used the Silex to you would do this huge blast that leveled Argoth. But at the same time, it ignited his Planeswalker Spark, and both the Might Stone and the Weak Stone fused into his eye sockets and became his new eyes. So Tokasia was actually hugely influential in their past. And what's really neat, too, as an added note, my friends, is... When they did the whole um, time spiral block planar chaos where they did like a shifted dimensions where everything had changed up and there was different versions of people, they actually gave a nod to Takasia. And instead of her being an artifist, an, artif an artificer, she was an elementalist. So we can see this in Primal Plasma. And this is, this is pretty cool, honestly. Primal Plasma is a nod to Primal Clay. Primal Clay is an artifact from the Antiquities days, and obviously with this information that they're giving us in this nod, it has something to do with the Kejo as well. So Primal Plasma is one blue and three colorless. As it enters the battlefield, it becomes a 3-3 three, three creature, or a 2-2 two, two creature with flying, or a 1-6 creature with defender, just like Primal Clay. And the flavor text is very cool. Takasia brushed the gears and cogs from the table. Then before two wide-eyed brothers, she began a lesson on raw elemental magic. It gives me chills. Honestly, when I read it, it gives me chills because it makes me think about an alternate timeline where Urza and Mishra are brought up with elemental magic instead of artificer magic. And what would that have looked like? We'll never know, but it's so much fuel for the imagination. I absolutely love it. Now, I want to let you guys know on a, on a side note, I have a second channel. We have a lot of fun over there. I make a lot of hilarious videos. Recently just put on an Aquaman review. Also, follow me on Twitch where we're having good times. We're streaming Arena and other fun games, sometimes just Jen. Come and hang out with me there. Want to give a special shout out to my patrons and channel members. Thank you very much for supporting my channel. If you've enjoyed this video, consider joining the ranks. Become one of the great ones. And remember, my friends, together we are the sixth color of magic.